Hello, I'm Angela Rice Beamer, and welcome to our program. It's called Chautauqua. Chautauqua is a living history humanities program that showcases famous people in history. Scholars and actors portray these famous people on stage and in full costume. You get to learn about the lives of these people in a fun and factually accurate way. Each year, there's a different theme, and this year's theme is Making Waves. It highlights the importance of water on the earth and the courageous adventurers who explored it. Water is essential for life. Water sustains life. Tonight's Chautauqua character began his adventures on water at an early age. He was born in Maryland, but completed numerous international expeditions at sea. He once said that there can be no conquest for the man who dwells in the narrow and small environment of a groveling life. Tonight's Chautauqua character is the adventurous and skilled explorer, Matthew Henson. Good evening. How's everyone tonight? Oh my goodness. There's a lot of people here, and that was very weak. Let's try that again. <laughs> Good evening. How's everyone doing tonight? Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. All right, so uh, just to let you know that I am here to promote my book. How many of you actually have a copy of my book? Shame on you. All right, make sure you get a copy of that. Uh, tonight, I will, I, well, I don't have any copies, but that's all right. I will show, share with you how to get a copy, but you make sure you get a copy of the book. You'll love it. It's absolutely a fascinating piece of work. That's because I wrote it. Um, but the book actually talks about the last two years of my life in the Arctic. But I'm going to share with you tonight how I got to be the man that I am. In August of 1866, uh, I was born not too far from here in Charles County, uh, Maryland. And when I was a young man working on the farm, my parents were sharecroppers. Uh, when I was two years old, my mother dies. When I was about seven, my father dies, tragically. But he had remarried and left my brothers and sisters and I with a young lady by the name of Nellie, who was my stepmother. She didn't like me, and I didn't like her. <laughs> so I did what most seven-year-olds would do if you're not happy at home, especially in those days, for a young black man. I decided to run away. Uh, keep count, because I do a lot of running away. So I'm gonna, <laughs> you're going to keep tabs on how many times I run away, all right? So I run away. This time, I leave uh, Maryland, and I end up in Washington, D.C. And when I get to Washington, D.C., I end up living with my uncle. Now, living with my uncle was not very bad. It really wasn't good either, but it wasn't real bad. Because uh, my uncle wanted, to, wanted the best for me. He wanted to make sure that I had a good life. So one of those things of ensuring that I had a good life was to go to school. Well, that was all right. It wasn't what I wanted to do, but it was all right. So uh, after a couple of years of going to school and realizing that it just wasn't school and I just weren't going to make it, I did something that most young black men would do. If you don't like something, you... Thank you, that's number two. Keep tabs, keep tabs. So I ran away. This time, I ended up at the CD pub in Washington owned by this woman by the name of Jamie. Well, I called her Aunt Jane. That's what everyone called her. It was a nice little seedy pub. It just had all these interesting characters that come in and, and see and talk. And at that time, for a nine-year-old, all I could do was wait on the tables and clean up. You know, it was a lot of fun. I was, but I was making money, which was very important in those days, to make some money. Well, there was a gentleman who would come by there, this wonderful character. He was just... Fascinating. His name was Baltimore Jack. 
Can you imagine a man by the name of Baltimore Jack and the impression that he made on this nine-year-old black boy? It was absolutely wonderful. Why? Because Baltimore Jack was the captain of his own ship and he had sailed the world. Well, every time he would come back, he would share all of his his adventures with me, and it was absolutely fascinating. He went to China, he went to Africa, he went all over the world, and it was just amazing. And he would bring back some of the trinkets that he found or whatever he got, so I was just utterly enthralled. I was like, wow, that would be so, like, yeah, I think I could do that. So right then I decided that I was going to be the captain of my own ship and I'm going to sail the world. <laughs> so I told Aunt Jane that's what I wanted to do. And she said to me, Matt, I don't think that would be a good idea. First of all, who's to say that Baltimore Jack actually did the things that he said he did? <laughs> Not to mention, it's very difficult for a black man to become, to own a ship, let alone be a captain of his own ship in America. I looked at her and said, I don't care what you say, Aunt Jane, I am going to be the captain of my ship and I'm going to sail the world. So uh, the next day while she was sleeping, I packed up with a little bit of a hat, what little things I had, and I had a dollar bill, a dollar to my name, and off I went. <laughs> That's the third time. You keeping count? All right, keep it count. So my third run, this time I walked 40 miles to Baltimore. When I get to Baltimore, the first ship I come to is the Katie Hines, my destiny. And at the helm was a gentleman by the name of Captain Childs. Now, Captain Childs is the gentleman that actually reshaped my entire life. He made me the man that I am today. And let me explain what happened. Well, not only was I on the ship, and I was a scrawny little nine-year-old, real small, real thin, but I was a scrawny little thing, but I could work. The one thing I did, one thing there was no problem with me was I had no problem with working and working hard. So while I was on this ship, if I'm going to be the captain of my own ship and I'm going to sail the world, that means I got to know everything there is to know about sailing. And that's what I did. I became a carpenter. I became a medic. I became a cook. I also learned how to navigate. I also learned how to mend the net and make any additions or amend, uh, amendments to any of the sails. There was nothing that I could not do on the ship if I was going to survive, if I was going to become the captain of my own ship. Trust me, I mastered it all. Ha! One thing I could not master and I had a hard time dealing with was racism. Yes, I was the only black on that particular ship. And racism, this was actually the first time I actually had to deal with it. And I really didn't know how to deal with it. So like most blacks, especially at a young age, and about, I was just about to become a teenager, I did what most young black men would do. Oh, yeah, you know what's about to happen. Oh, it's going to get ugly now. I took off my coat. I would get down to my cabin. I would work it. Yeah, I'm going to work it. I'm going to get on. I'm going to tear up on some white folk today. Yes, indeed. I'm going to have me a good time. I'm up. I may fall. I may be bloody. I don't care. But when I'm done, they will know that my name is not boy. I am not a coon. I'm not a monkey. I am Matthew Alexander Henson. What's my name? Matthew Alexander Henson. That's my name, and don't call me anything else but that. Well, while I'm sitting down there working it out, Captain Charles comes up to me and he says, Matt, what are you doing? Why are you, what, what are you doing? And I said, listen. I have had enough with the crew. I've had enough up to here. They are calling me everything but my name that my mama gave me when I was born. It's Matthew Alexander. That's right. Don't, don't forget it. 
Well, he heard my anger, and he says, come here, son. Put your coat back on and sit down. I looked at him, and I said, Cap, what you going to talk to me? Because I'm, I'm serious. I'm ready, to, I'm ready to get ugly. I'm about, to, I'm about to hurt somebody. And he said, Matt, I can't apologize for who you are or what you are. I cannot apologize for the ignorance that is in this world. But I can tell you this. This is not the solution to you overcoming racism. The answer to your problem is this. When you come across racism, pick up a book. Study the people. Study the words that are in the book. Learn all you can about the people you come in contact with. Understand who they are, where they're from, why they think the way they think. Learn about them. Learn their language. Learn their customs. Learn everything you can so that when you come across them, you will understand how they are. And you will approach them with this and this. This is how you're going to win. This is not going to do anything but cause more grief. Now, truthfully, for a young black man, teenager, I really wanted to pounce on some of them white boys that on that ship. I was ready. But Captain Charles was right. I'll be fighting for the rest of my life. I needed to figure out a better way of handling myself. So what did I do? That night, I picked up a book that was in my cabin. I read it from the beginning to the end. I picked up whatever book I could find on the ship. I read it from the beginning to the end. When we stopped at various ports, I studied the people. I learned the language. I did whatever I could so I could understand who they are and what they are so that the next time I ran across any type of racism, I would handle it with this opposed to this. Trust me, as time goes on for the next several years of my life, oh, when you read my book, <laughs> you'll understand that Captain Charles reshaped my whole life. Well, here we are. I spent the rest of my days uh, on, the, on uh, the Katie Hines, and it was like another 10 years, and then Captain Charles dies. And once he dies, there's really no reason for me to remain on the ship because he was the buffer that kept me, kept peace uh, with the other crew. So I left the ship. And no matter what ship I went on, I had to deal with racism. And I had had enough. So after many years of that, I decided to go back home. Well, I guess that idea of me becoming captain of my ship and sailing the world is gone because I didn't want to deal with racism. And I figured I'd come out with something else better to do. So I ended up in Washington, D.C., and you'll never guess what job I ended up doing. Yes, I ended up working in a hat shop for men. It's the only job I could find. Can you imagine a man, a sailor, who can, who's a carpenter, who can do almost anything, build anything, go anywhere, see anything, do almost anything, and the best thing he could do was work in a hat shop. Well, I made the best of it. So there I am working in this hat shop, and I'm in the back doing what I always do, and in comes this gentleman by the name of Robert Perry. Now, Robert Perry at the time was a lieutenant. He was working for the Navy, and he is on his way to Nicaragua because they are uh, excavating some land for, to build a canal. He's looking for a cabin boy. Yes, you're laughing. Well. He's looking for a cabin boy, and while he's talking to the owner of the store, he mentions this, and my boss says, hey, I know just the person that will help you. And he calls, he says, hey, Matt, come on out front. And I come out front, and I meet Mr. Perry, and we're sitting there, and we're talking, and while we're talking, I explain to him, and I share with him my qualifications, all the things that I am capable of doing. I am not a cabin boy.
I'm too old and I'm too qualified to be a cabin boy. But unfortunately, like most white men in those days, a black man comes up and tells you what he is capable of doing. You do not believe a word. And he didn't. But I looked in his eyes and I saw something different that I never saw in another white man other than Captain Childs. I saw compassion, I saw uh, love, I saw trust. And I figured I'd give him a try. <laughs> Truthfully, I wanted to go to Nicaragua to prove to him that I was capable of doing everything I said I could do. That was my motive. So we get to Nicaragua. And while we're in Nicaragua, his team is out there doing whatever it is they're doing, and one of the guys falls down and gets hurt. Well, wasn't that a great opportunity? So I picked up my medic bag, ran out there, gave him, put him, mend him back together, and I picked up where he left off. And let me tell you, Robin Perry stood there and he said, wow, he really could do everything he said he could do. Wow. That's the man that's going to take me to the North Pole. Ha <laughs> ha, yes, I found S. So we're going to go to the North Pole. Well, after Nicaragua, he pulls me to the side and he says, man, I have an opportunity to go to the North Pole, and I would like for you to accompany me, and I would love to have you by my side. What do you think? I said, wow, this would be a wonderful opportunity for me. I've never been to the North Pole, and of course, I'm not going to be the captain of my own ship, and I'm not going to sail the world, but this would be a very good opportunity. So yes, I'll go. And he says, oh, by the way, I won't be able to pay you. <laughs> That's not a good way to start this relationship without pay. <laughs> but he does, for the next 20 some odd years, Make sure that I have a job every time we come back. So this first time, we come back, and after we leave Nicaragua, we end up in Philadelphia. While he's trying to get the money that he needs, he gets me a job at the Naval Yard in Philadelphia. Wow, oh, this is really good. I got a nice little, nice little piece of change. This is really good. And not only that, but I'm a man of 21 years old. And what do you think a young man of 21 years old is going to do in Philadelphia? Yeah, come on, come on. You can take a bow, guess. Yeah, I'm gonna fall in love. Yeah, 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 yeah. I gotta, I gotta get. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I fall in love. I met this beautiful woman by the name of Eva Flint. Oh my God, that was a beautiful woman. Ooh, Lord, she was a. Uh, never mind. Uh, but she was a beautiful woman, and I married her in April of '88. We get married. Well, in June of 88, I get a phone call from Robert Perry. You know where this is going, right? I get a phone call from Robert Perry saying, Matt, are you ready to go? And I said, yes. I walk over to my wife of two months and I say, babe, I am on my way to Greenland. And I, I don't know how long I'll be gone, but I'm ready to go. And I, I'll see you when I get back. She goes, oh, 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 Excuse me? What, the, what? No, 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 no. We just got married. No, 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 no. You have a job. No. They're, they're, this, this job at the Naval Yard is security. What are you doing? I said, I, I have to go. I told you that I was going to go as soon as Robert Perry called me that I was, I was leaving. I was going to go to Greenland. She goes, yes, but no. <laughs> You're staying here with me. I, uh, we're not going to get into this argument. I'm not going to spend the rest of the night trying to explain to you the argument. So you know I leave. And I'm off, to, I'm off to Greenland. And when I leave the Greenland, we end up in New York. And just before we get on the kite, we're about to take off. There on the docks are all these people. Bands are playing. I mean, there's just tons of people. Never, I've never seen this before. And the reporters. I tell you, no matter where I go, racism just seems to follow me. It's just, it's just aggravating. So there the reporters are sitting there, and they're just writing away saying, why is Robert Perry taking a black man to the Arctic? Doesn't he know that their skin is not designed to survive in the Arctic? They're only good for the South, in the sun, working the fields. That's all they can do. Really? 
Let me tell you, for the next 23 years, I couldn't wait every time I came back to make sure that every last one of those white reporters ate crow. Yes, the black man survived, and yes, the black man can do it, and yes, the black man is back again. Now what do you got to say? Absolutely nothing. So here we are. We're on our way to Greenland. And once while we're getting there, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, Greenland was beautiful. Oh, when we pulled in McCormick Bay, there was snow-capped mountains. There was green trees. There's greenery all over the place. There were flowers. Oh, it was the most beautiful place I had ever seen in my life. I was, wow. This is amazing. Well, after I did all the sightseeing I could, there was work to be done. Let me tell you, now I told you that there was nothing I could not do on the ship. And Robert Perry took quite a good advantage of that because I was responsible for building all of the sleds. I was responsible for making sure that all the supplies were needed. They were categorized and they were placed where they were supposed to be. Yes, see, I had the most years of seamanship ever more than anyone on the ship any member of the crew. I spent more time on sea, so I knew what had to be done, so everyone depended on me to make sure that everything was accompanied, everything was done. So here we are, we arrive, almost we arrive in, oh, I got to share this interesting story. The ship gets into the ice and we get stuck. So the crew and I get out, we chipping at the ice so that the ship can get through. While we are chipping at the ice and the ship jolts, guess what happens to Robert? He falls and breaks his leg. We haven't even gotten started yet and the man is injured. So that puts us behind a couple months. So be it. We get to McCormick Bay, we arrive, and the natives are amazing. They're absolutely amazing, you see? They're so used to European men coming and going on their, on their shores, they'd never seen a black man before. And it was absolutely amazing for them as well as it was for me. You see, when they came up to me to shake my hand and say hi, they would grab my hand, and before they would grab the hand, they would pull up the sleeve and rub my skin to make sure it wouldn't come off because they had never seen someone who looked like them. And when they realized that I was authentic, they were like, yes, somebody like us. And I said, yes, somebody like me. Well, we get to McCormick Bay, and while we're at McCormick Bay, I start to get our, our house set up. I build a wonderful home for us. It's called, uh, it's called Red Cliff, and they had two big rooms, a room for the Perrys and a huge room for myself. And when we got finished and got settled in, it was August the 8th. What happened on August the 8th? My birthday, thank you very much. That's the only people who read the book. Uh, it's my birthday. And believe it or not, Robert Perry and his wife threw me a birthday party. No one has ever done that. So here we are building a relationship between the two of us. For the next 18 years, we are coming and going through the Arctic. We are both experiencing frostbite. We are learning how to survive. I myself took it upon myself to make sure that the natives and I were very close. I learned everything there was to learn about them. I learned the, the language fluently. I learned all their customs. I did everything there was, I learned it and mastered it because it was going to help us survive in the Arctic. It was needed. Well, now I'm going to bring you to the book. So we get to, we are now in our last trek. This is our last chance to make it to the North Pole. We are Prior to 1908, we are about 200 miles south of actually getting to the North Pole. Robert Perry had picked his crew. Now, I want to share with you in the time 
that we spent, there was nothing that Robert Perry and I did not do. He made sure that I was up every time we went out, and I made sure he was up. Even though in that first uh, few years prior to, Robert Perry gets, gets frostbite, and he actually loses nine of his toes, and, and, and it was by the grace of God that we actually get him to the camp so that he doesn't lose his, both his legs, I mean his, his feet. So he's already with nine toes, I mean with only one toe, and he's trying to get to the North Pole. So here we are making our way to the North Pole, and something happens once we get there that has never happened before. Well, first of all, we get to the North Pole, and once we arrive, when Perry gave us the okay, he places the flag at the top of the world. And can you imagine? Here I am, through all the racism that I had to deal with, I am actually the first black man to stand foot on the top of the world, the first black, the first white man to stand, American, to stand on top of the world was Robert Perry. We are the first Americans to stand on the top of the world. Nobody else can say that but me. Oh, that's a good feeling. Trust me, I couldn't wait to get back to New York to just rub it in their faces. I did it! <laughs> I made it! <laughs> so, there we are at the top of the world, and I go to shake Robert's hand, and he did something that he's never done. He ignored me. He walked away. Well, I said, oh, there's nothing to it because he's got probably the, is the storm getting ready to come up, and maybe he just didn't see me, and he's really trying to get at Not to mention that because of the situation with his feet that he had to get out of the ice and he wanted to get back to the camp. Nothing of it. So he gets, he actually, the next night, when I wake up, he actually left me at the top of the world. He's never done that before. So I meet him at the ship. I didn't say anything. Maybe it's beginning because of his situation with his feet. So I meet him at the ship. We found out that one of our crew members had fallen into the ice, and he dies. So I go over to console him, and I try to give, share, you know, let him know about the grieving of our, the loss of our friend, and he actually walked away from me. Huh. Maybe he's grieving, because everybody grieves differently, so maybe he needs some space. Okay, that's fine. So we get on the ship, and as we're trying to make our way back to the United States, uh, he's in the mess hall, and he's eating breakfast. And I get my tray, and I go, and I sit down right next to him, and he got up and walked away. Wow. Maybe he's still grieving. That's what it is. He's still grieving. So I, I let that go. Well, we arrive in New York City. We get to New York, and once we get to New York, the president of the United States is there, Theodore Roosevelt, who the ship is named after that uh, actually got us to the North Pole. And there are thousands and thousands of people. There's bands playing. There's just all kinds of people standing there. And all members of the crew are up on the podium with Robert. And he begins to announce everybody and thank them all. And he calls them all by name except me. He didn't even recognize, he didn't even say my friend, Nat, of 23 years was there. Nothing. I got absolutely nothing from him. I don't know what happened. Three years later, I decided to write my book. And I asked Robert, I had to ask his permission. And when he, and the, what he told me was I had to turn the book in so he can make the rewrites and make any necessary corrections. And of course, he just, I don't know what happened. I, I, I don't understand how I sacrificed my life for this man. I helped him do the things that he wanted to do, and he just ignored me. It was very difficult for the next 20 years for me to try to make a life 
for my wife, my new wife, and ourselves. Because he denied me to being at the top of the world with him, therefore no one else believed that we were actually there, that I was actually there. I want to share something out of my book. When the news of the discovery of the North Pole by Commander Perry was first sent to the world, a distinguished citizen of New York City, well versed in the affairs of the Perry Arctic Club, made the statement that he was sure that Matt Henson had been with Commander Perry on the day of the discovery. There were not many people who knew who Henson was or the reason why the gentleman had made the remark. And when asked why he was so certain, he explained that for the best part of the 20 years of Commander Perry's Arctic work, his faithful and often only companion was Matthew Alexander Henson. That is my story, and I'm not changing a word. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here with Keith Henley, who's just performed as Matthew Henson. Thank you very much for joining us, and thank you for coming to, to do your performance. Well, we really you enjoyed much. it. It's been a pleasure and an honor. I appreciate it. Um, when I read uh, A Negro Explorer at the North Pole, mm -hmm. when I closed the book, I said, my heart was kind of beating fast, and I said, what an adventure. This was really a saga that they, that they went on, mm -hmm. um, and, and I really enjoyed Henson's book. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when he was there, the Inuits called him uh, Mari po Paluk, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Matthew the Kind, or the Kind One. Yes. And do you think that came from his respect for the people? Very much so. Uh, and not only that, uh, it also came from the love that he had for them and the, the love that they had for him. There was a bond of togetherness uh, between the two of them. And when they first met each other, they just pretty much just almost like fell in love with each one another. And he really took to them, it was his responsibility, not so much his responsibility, it was a love to learn as much about them as possible, as well as them to learn about him. And he was the one on the expedition that knew the language fluently rather than the others. I think I read that they said that the others talked like babies, but he, he, he talked. He, like he it. talked to them with, with a lot of love and respect, and he learned the custom as well as the, the language fluently. And uh, Perry actually depended on him to make sure that whatever trading, whatever needed to be done, uh, that he made sure they got done because uh, Henson was, was versed in, in the customs of the people. Yes. Now, uh, uh, Henson didn't have a lot of outward love and kindness in his upbringing, but he developed that quality on his own mm -hmm. w or with the help of uh, Captain Childs and perhaps the woman he called Aunt Jane mm -hmm. or Aunt Janie. Um, so th there were people in his life that helped him uh, develop that or, or bring that out. And I think he took that perhaps to the Inuit people. That is true. And if it had not been for Captain Childs, who actually helped him overcome or understand how to develop a, uh, a way to overcome racism, it, it, that really helped him understand the need for him to learn other people and other customs and other languages. Yeah, and that made him indispensable among with his other skills. That is correct. Uh, that is on, correct. On the expeditions. Um, did he ever get a chance to reconnect with his brothers and sisters because he left home so very early? There is actually, in the, in the research that I've done, there's really not much that says that he actually uh, reunited with them. As a matter of fact, there is no account that of him ever coming back to Maryland, uh, to Charles County, to see 
any of them or let alone if any of them came to New York or tried to uh, track him down to, to uh, rekindle a relationship. So I really don't know too much about the rest of his family mm -hmm. here, but I do know about the Inuit family that he had uh, in Greenland. Yes, yes. And um, we'll talk a little bit later about the, the reunion. He was, he had passed on by that time, but mm -hmm. there was a reunion where his son and uh, Perry's son got a chance to come to the United States for a, a reunion. Um, t tell us about how they dealt with, the, the, the party dealt with the sleds and the dogs. I saw some pictures in the book of, of bunch of dogs that were on the ship <laughs> in a confined area, but, but th that was their primary mode of transportation, so they were very important. There, there was, um, you couldn't make it in the Arctic without a dog sled, uh, and it was very important, and Henson's job was to make sure that he constructed and he designed the sleds, and uh, on the ship there was enough space for him to actually put everything together. Uh, there was an area where the dogs were kept and it was his responsibility to train them and to put everything in, 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 in place. He was also responsible for all the supplies, whatever need, whatever was needed for any of these, these treks or these adventures out. He was responsible for everything. Perry depended on him to provide to make sure that everything was in place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the treatment that he received once they returned from the pole, um, not just from uh, the commander, Commander Peary, but also from the press and, and everyone else. He well, the, uh, the, story, the story is that once they came back, the press never asked him whether or not he was there. They were only concerned about the story about Cook. Cook was the gentleman who actually claimed that the year prior to that he actually made it to the North Pole before, he, uh, before Perry did. And, but when he returns, he doesn't have any evidence that he actually made it. And so everyone, all of the reporters kept asking Henson his opinion of whether or not Cook had actually made it to the North Pole. That was all they asked. They never asked him whether or not what it was like to be at the North Pole or, uh, you know, how was it to be in the Arctic or anything like that. So they, they, all they wanted to know was his account or what his thoughts were about Cook. As far as the others, um, the, the, uh, the explorers community, the scientific community really didn't give much uh, credence to Henson because Perry had denounced him and did not give him the recognition that he, was, that, that he was actually there. So therefore, they didn't really acknowledge him at, at all, as well as the scientific community, the Explorers Club really didn't give him any, any opportunity to uh, become a member thereof or uh, allowed him to do much. Uh, so it was very difficult for him, very difficult. And, and National Geographic was also sort of denying uh, accolades for it, it took Henson. almost 30 years before Matthew Henson actually was able to get any type of recognition as being an explorer or actually being at the top of the world. So it took a while. What do you think changed so that he was finally admitted to the Explorers Club? What do, you, what do you think changed in their attitudes toward him so that he finally did gain admission? to some things. <laughs> well, believe it or not, there were two members of the crew, the original crew that actually made it, that were still alive, that were still uh, very active with the Explorers Club. And they were the two, they were the ones that were really pushing to make sure that Henson got the recognition that he deserved. So they had the proof and the evidence that proved that Henson was there. Even though when they arrived the first time after they had uh, got to the North Pole, Robert Perry had put restrictions that everyone had to turn everything in. Uh, all of their diaries and pictures, everything had to be turned in. But they were able to keep some of their information and they shared that with the Explorers Club and eventually the Explorers Club actually gave in and actually um, acknowledged him as being an explorer and mm -hmm. invited him and made him a member. 
not on his merit or not by his account, but by the accounts of others. That is correct. The same thing with the Inuits that actually made it to the poll. They weren't considered, considered credible witnesses to the events that happened either. No, they, that, they is, were that is correct. That's correct. Not only that, but no one in the United States would even, would even consider going back to the to Greenland to even interview anyone that had made it. So yes, that was that was the other reason why they just didn't give any credence to that. Mm -hmm. Now Perry wrote the foreword to a Negro explorer at the North Pole. I wonder why he did that. If he and 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 as I read it, it it wasn't overly exuberant in terms of Henson's contributions, mm -hmm. but it wasn't totally negative either. And I wonder wh why he agreed to do that, whether it was... Well, it was actually, uh, Henson actually asked him if he would. Uh, he needed, Henson actually needed Perry's approval. He needed Perry to come to the understanding or at least acknowledge that he did, that he was there. And if it what. You had to understand for the last 20 some odd years that they were going, but every time they came back from Greenland, Perry was responsible for making sure that Matthew Henson had a job. And Matthew just wanted to make sure that uh, Perry held up his bargain to make sure that he took care of him. Just make sure that I have a job so that I can continue on. Because he wasn't paying him a lot of money while he was away, so he needed Perry to to make sure that once he got back to the United States that he could survive. And, uh, but he needed Perry to, uh, to respond to that book and he really needed him to give a, uh, acknowledge that the book was there so, or else he wasn't gonna make it. Mm -hmm. And he conceded to he do did. it. He mm -hmm. did, he mm -hmm. did. Yeah, um, uh, in the 2001 introduction to a Negro Explorer at the North Pole, uh, a man named Robert Bryce does the, uh, the um, introduction, and he talks about the contradictions to the to um, Henson's accounts of things in terms of dates and and things <laughs> like that, <laughs> and and, and th that's one thing. And then a, a second thing is there's a person named Wally Herbert who in 1989 wrote. Uh, saying that they couldn't have made it because the navigation was off, but that has been dealt with and the navigation was not necessarily off, but that caused a big controversy that they didn't even get to the North Pole, neither of them. That but is, um, and the, the interesting thing was when uh, Henson writes his first book in 1912, he only deals with what took place uh, in the last two years, in 1908 and 1909, and them actually getting to the North Pole. When he writes his next book, The Dark Companion, almost 30, 40 years later, he is a much older man who now has to try to remember exactly what happened. So, of course, a lot of his, a lot of information is a little off. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people try to piece the, the two pieces together. But if you read the two books, one only deals with the last two years, whereas Dark Companion tries to do his entire life. So uh, yes, there are some things that are a little off. Now, as far as the navigation is concerned, no one else has actually charted to get to the North Pole. And there is, they've been speculating for years that, um, that they never made it. But in actuality, like you said, the navigation wasn't off. It was pretty much dead on, and uh, a lot of people don't understand that the shifting of the ice at the top of the world is very difficult for them to navigate. So they made it, they did pretty good with, for a first time, mm -hmm. for a first time. And they were saying that Peary's um, uh, account that he wrote in his uh, log books and, and diaries um, didn't mention taking out certain navigational tools. But if you're trying to race to the North Pole and it's cold, he used, um, I think, a sextant and something else that I don't remember that, that, that made the navigation correct. So mm -hmm. the Herbert um, denunciation of the whole uh, knowledge that they had gotten to the North Pole it has, been, has been discounted. Um, there's a Matthew Henson day, right? We've got about two minutes left. Okay. There, there's a Matthew Henson Day 
uh, that, that I've heard about. And um, in some of the uh, audience questions, they mentioned that, or uh, questions and comments, they mentioned that there is a Matthew Henson Park in Montgomery County, Maryland. So that's kind of interesting. That is interesting. And I, I was really surprised that there's a, a park here in Montgomery, but there's nothing in Charles County. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so right. we had to figure out well, how we're going to fix that. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and very quickly, and I'm sorry we're out of time, but what's next for you? Well, from here, I have two more performances here in Maryland uh, to do, um, to continue to tell the Matthew Henson story. And then I go back home and I study two more people. I'm going to add to my repertoire of, uh, of uh, men to study. So I, I'm looking forward to studying more about uh, black men and the history that, and the accomplishments that they left behind in, in, in American history. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for Thank being here. Thank you very here. much for really, the opportunity. Really I appreciate it. Continued opportunity. Continued success to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> you uh, have been watching Chautauqua. Our theme has been Making Waves. Thanks for joining us. I'm Angela Rice Beamer from the Germantown campus of Montgomery College. Good night. <laughs>